Well, good evening to you. It's a, uh, it's a real joy for me to be here, and uh, I'm extremely humbled, really. Um, you know what? Let's open the Bible. Exodus chapter 3, <laughs> before I get carried away. <laughs> Exodus chapter 3, I'm going to read a few verses from there. I was promised a whiteboard. I don't know if that's going to appear suddenly or not. I forgot. So if it's, oh, it is there. Oh, very clever. Well, at the, at the right time, you can bring it up. Thanks. Exodus chapter 3. I'm going to read a few verses from there, and then I'm also going to read from the book of Timothy. Oh, I don't want to disturb the recording. It'll, it'll be fine just there for now, I think. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. From verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest in Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. The Lord is here. <laughs> He's here. Forgive me, forgive me, all my sins, forgive me. <laughs> Verse 5. <laughs> and then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the Lord of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then I also want to read from 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful appointing me to his service, through, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost." But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to, to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. says this charge I entrust to you. Uh, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies pre previously made about you. Well, I am, um, when I said I'm humbled, I really mean it uh, to be here because I have a huge, huge respect for you guys as a movement, uh, the vineyard, and uh, sometimes I feel like you guys, by the grace of God, you taught I feel, to me anyway, taught the church the value of worship that captures intimacy with God. And I'm glad as we worship today to see that none of that, not an ounce of that is lost. And that's a beautiful thing. And so I'm humbled to be here. I, uh, you know, you get born somewhere in Africa, you grow up and you do life. You never, there are just some things you never really think necessarily you will get to do so for me in my own life I am my prayer life is taken up a lot by thank you thank you thank you Lord with a lot more thank you Lord uh, I, I really love you guys and I'm just so thankful to be here 
I want to say a big thanks all, particularly to John uh, Mumford and to Eleanor inviting me to come speak here. Uh, I've gotten to know John over the past, I think, two or three years. There's a forum, particular forum, where we would meet each other uh, and uh, he's contributing. He is the most English man I know. <laughs> <laughs> He is the most, English. this man should be king of England. <laughs> Honestly, just amazing. The way he talks, the words he uses. I'm like, is this real? It is. And my plan is to take him one day to some part of Africa and say, this is my friend. <laughs> And then I'll say to them, shh, John, speak. <laughs> I, I, I really, really love him and just love to be around him. And uh, we were just talking earlier on today about the circles in which we find ourselves and the moments. We just have great moments of fellowship. Uh, just such a dear, um, uh, lovely Godly man, and of course, also, and obviously with Eleanor, his wife, as well, and uh, John. I I if ever you've been invited to preach, you don't have much to say. Talk a lot about those who invited you. <laughs> <laughs> so, now on to John and Debbie Wright. <laughs> on to John and who are such lovely people. Mm. I, I'm telling, this is a real short sermon, so um, let us discuss Debbie's shoes for a moment. <laughs> well, the few words that I do have to share with you, I pray that the Lord, that you would speak. That I be nothing more than an instrument through which your word will come, but let it be your word that comes. Your word that is strong, that it breaks the cedars of Lebanon so that they skip like a calf. Let that word come this evening. That at the end of it, we all be edified and Jesus glorified in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. <clears throat> it's Bill Bright, who is a very well-known name in America. I think he's going to be with the Lord now. Who, on one occasion, wanting to evangelized to a person he'd met, a businessman, wealthy person. He decided to write a letter to this person, trying to evangelize to talk to them about Jesus. And in that letter, one of the first sentences, I think, in fact, the first sentence he wrote in that letter, he said this, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. That this God that you don't believe in and so on, you just need to know God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And I start there because that obviously today is a mantra that we use a lot in the body of Christ, and rightly so, because it is true. And in fact, I'm referencing it because the Bible says that when in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says this, the plan, I know the plans that I have towards you, they're plans of good, not of evil. And this evening, I want to take a few moments just to talk about your calling that we have all been called by God for God's glory. And the more that we remember that and learn to walk in the good of the call, it just changes life and makes it far more fulfilling than anything else. That God has a calling on your life. He has a plan and a purpose for you as a leader in whatever capacity of leadership you're in. In fact, he has a plan for every one of his children. Every single one of his children. And so I'm calling this the contours of our call, that as we have been called by God to serve him, to love him, to represent him, the different angles and the contours of our call is an important thing for us all to see and grasp. And when I think of this kind of talk, particularly to leaders, I very quickly think about this story that I read to you, the story of Moses. And it's a story that everybody is familiar with because when it comes to understanding your call, it, is, it happens in different ways to different people. But the 
base ingredients are actually always the same. Now, this story in Exodus chapter 3, God comes to Moses. And in coming to Moses, something very dramatic, very dramatic happens. I want you to think of it this way. Here is a guy, Hebrew, you know the story. He ends up in the palace, and he grows up in the palace with all the privileges of the palace and all the education of the palace. But doubtless at some point, he realized that actually he is not an Egyptian, he's Hebrew. At some point, he got it. I'm not an Egyptian, I'm a Hebrew. And for sure, that there, there must have been a certain kind of passion on the inside of him for his people who he saw serving and slaving away. And at some point, that passion just came, it wrenched his soul that he went to help his people. And you know the story. Well, one day he saw somebody fighting. He goes to defend the Hebrew against the Egyptian, and he kills the Egyptian. And in killing the Egyptian, he buries the Egyptian, and very soon <laughs> finds out that the story is known because he goes to defend somebody else the second day, and they say, don't kill us like you killed the guy the last time. And here we have then a man who runs away and has to leave everything behind. He leaves everything behind. And he ends up in the desert for 40 years. And in the desert for 40, 40 years is a long time. Because we read these things and we just flip over. Flip over. For four, four decades, a guy that had a life and prospects, the apparent heir to the throne, opportunities, suddenly finds himself 40 years in a desert where he's thinking about the past. Why, maybe he's wondering, why did I even bother to defend the jolly guy? And then maybe other times he think, well, at least I did the right thing. But it's landed me in the middle of nowhere, looking after sheep, day after day, Day after day for 40 years. 40 years in the wilderness. But one day, something happens. As he walks past and he sees a burning bush. And the first point I wanted to bring out to you when it comes to our call is this. That the nature of our call is supernatural. Supernatural. That the call of God upon your life is actually supernatural. It is not something made by man that all comes through man. It's completely by God. The nature of it is supernatural. Where he walks and he sees the bush. He's seen the bush burning, but it's not consumed. It's a miracle happening right there in front of him. It turns out this is not just any other day like all the other days. And the Bible says he turns aside to see this thing. And as he turns aside to see it, he realizes what this thing is. It's a miracle, and he's scared. He's chagrined. He's moved. You would have been as well. Not just does he see this thing, there's a voice that is speaking to him and calling him by name. Moses, Moses. The Bible says he turned aside to it. The nature of our call is exactly like that. That you and I must always remember, I was called by God to do whatever it is that he has wired me to do for now. And that calling is a supernatural calling, therefore cannot be drained away by man if you won't allow it. And wherever this call happens, wherever this call genuinely happens, it, it, it lifts you to a different orbit, actually. The problem is that sometimes we let our call get diluted out or dispersed of by just the stuff of life. 
And every so often we need to rekindle that thing. But the calling is there. Well, Paul, the apostle says, I, Paul, call. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, called by God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, I, Paul, call by God. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, I, Paul, call. Not by man or through man, but through God. The calling is by, and wherever this calling is, I'll tell you something. Like I read it to you in 1 Timothy, Paul says, there's always, listen, a sense of gratitude that he called me. He called me. A sense of gratitude. He starts there by saying, I thank him who enabled me, who called me. A sense of gratitude. I can't believe that he called me. Not just that, there's a sense of amazement where he says that he didn't just call me, he appointed me. It's the sense of being put in a particular place where God says, I put you here. Let me stop for a second and Three important things in your life. If you will figure them out, you're done. Number one, what God has called you to do. Number two, where God has called you to do it. To be in exactly the right place and the right location. And number three, to find out who God has put alongside you to help you in doing that. If you will keep those three, go write them on your wall somewhere until you figure them out. Because... It's everything. Those two things I just told you. What the, the calling upon your life, the place, so that you stop jumping. Maybe your churches are different from the ones in London. But Christians just no direction, no inkling, no. They just move from church to church looking for the one with the best Sunday school. I mean, they take this whole big call of God into. No, no, no. It's all about Sunday schools. And it's bigger than that, much bigger than that. That comes into it, but it's much bigger than that. To find out where he's placed you and who he's put alongside you, and I'll tell you this right now, if you're married, that's the person. <laughs> so stop looking around, looking, that she's here, she is the one. This is not hard, this is easy, that's the one. So even if she says, I'm not gifted this way, it doesn't matter. This is the person, done. This will help you stop looking around. You're done. <laughs> he talks about the sense of amazement when he says this, that he appointed me who was formerly a blasphemer, a pers- a, a, you know, he was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. He calls himself insolent and an opponent of God. He says, and yet he called me. When the call is there, you are completely daily amazed. It, it, it helps you speak with humility and act with gentility because you realize, I never even deserve this. I never deserve this. I mean, I get to lead at Jubilee Church and everything is going well. And very often I think, they think I'm real clever, I'm bright. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I just let them think that. <laughs> I let them think that. It's, if I, you know. And I'm glad that all these years I still haven't been found out. Praise the Lord. (laughs) It has to do with the sense of worship that is summoned when he talks about Christ Jesus. This is all in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. Christ Jesus who saved mankind, saved uh, saved you and I from the world into his kingdom. And then he begins to talk about The king, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. To him be all honor and glory forever and ever. Can you shout amen to that? Good. (laughs) Because he is the king forever. Love those songs we sang today. He really is the king and there is no other. A sense of gratitude. Knowing that I, he called, God called me. So I can be set to a sense of amazement that he would bother with the likes of me. A sense of worship that this is the mighty God, the king of immortal, invisible. And then a sense of commission where he says, now, Timothy, I charge you, my child, Timothy, I charge you. That which has been entrusted to you, keep it well. Your call 
is a supernatural call. Because it goes on to say to Timothy, actually, this call came by prophecies. So the prophetic dimension is always there. I'll tell you why this is so important. If you don't see your call as something supernatural, you will just do the works you do for God in daily life. You will just do it out of just a natural is what I do. And it just drains the joy out of it. But whenever you remember God called me and gifted me, and I do what I do for the king, it makes all the difference. All the difference. It means you attend to it with even to the smallest detail because you're doing it for God who called you. The Bible says Moses turned and he saw the supernatural burning bush. Not just that, he heard a voice, God speaking. Not just that, God then says to him, take off your shoes. Take off your sandals, he says to him. As he wants to go closer, take off your sandals. Become barefooted. Because you see, when you begin to walk in the realm of the supernatural, you have to remove everything else that is of the natural angle. You never start with the natural anymore. You always start with the supernatural. He says to him, take your shoes off. Take your, he says to him, take your shoes off, your sandals. The sandals that you made with your hands, that I want nothing that you will contribute to this next thing that is of you will not be of primary importance here. This is super, take off your shoes. Abandon that which is of the natural order. Take it, not just in, in taking it, you know when you take it off, how you begin to feel the penetrating, puncturing power of the pebbles on the ground. It has, you feel it's different. It's different from the way it's all insulated before. It's all covered up and you can go. Now you feel this thing. Where this call, this is different. It's of a completely different order. And I tell you one other thing. It adjusts your pace. Because you're feeling this. You know, I, Moses, I want you to be vulnerable before me. Not cocksure. Vulnerable. Vulnerable. He says to him, take off your shoes. And he did. From this point on, we're going to do everything we do, Moses, with a supernatural tangent to it every time. And none of this erases the natural dimension, the natural talents is given, but they just don't come first. It is first the prophetic and then the pragmatic. And if you recognize that this is the nature of the call is supernatural, and the second thing is this. I want to talk to you about the source of the call. And the source of the call is simply this. It's God. God is the source of the call. And if God is the source of the call that you have on your life, then abide with him. I want to talk to you a little bit about your devotional life. Because it has everything to do with your calling. Abide with him. When I think of leadership... Now, let me ask the cameraman, if I was to go down there, does that work for you? Yeah? I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> I'm just trying to be English and polite. <laughs> when I think of leadership, it being a leadership conference, and how one leads, this is how it works for me. This is how I see it. I see a whole, this is, this, is, this is Trent Vineyard. All the people, they're here. Okay. I'm gone. I never knew I could draw this. These are beautiful. No, I changed. This is Jubilee Church. <laughs> there they are. Oh, I've got a few females. <laughs> got, got a few girls. <laughs> And then you have the leader guy. This is, this is me, the leader guy, okay? So, you know, leadership has to do with, you know, in many ways standing in front. Not always, but standing. So there's the leader guy. And uh, he's in front of all the people. Let me tell you. The terrain you have to lead these people. 
for you, the leader, you have to learn well. When you talk to the people, hello, everybody, fine. Then you find a time where you escape and you have to run on top the mountain. And you have to get there and find this God afresh, in a fresh way to hear from God. And when, you've get, when you are up there and you spend time with him saying, don't let me go without your glory. God, they, they always think you're brilliant when you're down here. You need his perspective, his grace, his goodness, his vision. And then he begins to show you what the next phase was going to look like. And then you've got it. You don't always know it 100%, but you know it enough to know what that terrain looks like. And now you're going to go back with your preaching series in mind. <laughs> because you know what the next phase is like. If you're not dumb, you've got to fix your preaching series to help that, haven't you? You get back there and you say to them, good morning, Jubilee. Today we're going to learn on, and then you're going to teach them. This is how, to me, leadership is not a whole lot more complex than this. But I'll tell you something. You need to divide this thing up into three parts. And I call this the devotional. This has to do with intimacy. This is where you are kneeling before God, your devotional life. This bit where you're walking is where you're walking with God. This has to do with your own personal walk, integrity. I won't speak about that today, but it's massive. And finally, this is you leading the people and you have to leverage your leadership, gifting, and everything down here. But the point is this. Wherever the devotional life is missing, you lose the voice of, the, of God. You lose the supernatural dimension. You may have a whole bunch of activity, but you'll be going nowhere fast. You can never forfeit the devotional life. It's everything. It's everything. When I think of the devotional life, talking here about your source, that is, it is God. Therefore, you must have moments where you are close to God and you cultivate that kind of way of hearing from God. When I think about the devotional life, I'm essentially talking about learning to hear from God learning to hear the voice of God, and then through that, you lead others. And here I'm referencing a kind of day-to-day, moment-by-moment quest to abide with the Lord in a pattern that is regular and consistent, where you are often before God early in the day. Psalm 63, verse 1, O Lord my God, earnestly will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee, my flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. When I'm lost, then I go into the sanctuary, then I find your power and your glory. You need that. Every Christian needs that, let alone leaders. Oh, Lord, my God, earnestly, another translation says, early will I seek thee. Talking here about learning to seek him early in the day. Communicating with the Holy Spirit during the day, every time. Receiving divine counsel every day. Asking for guidance as a leader frequently during the day. Praising God endlessly throughout the day, bowing in his presence at nighttime at the end of the day. There's no substitute there is no substitute for spending time with God from the beginning and right through. I could teach you 50 pragmatic, fantastic things about leadership that I've read from books that are good. 
but none of it will be a substitute for spending time with God. And I'm not talking about a devotional life that is pursued with religious regularity to earn points, but something that is about honest vulnerability before God, where you learn to, you might want to write this down, I'll give you very quickly seven points, seven components of a good devotional life as a leader. Number one, there's purity. That is to say, you're coming before God, very often with the Word of God, just you, <clears throat> and you're coming with no mixed motives. No mixed motives. Where the, in this place, you can be recklessly, ruthlessly honest with your Maker and say, This is how I feel, this is how I see it, this is what I did. Purity. Number two is intimacy. To seek an encounter with God, no matter how small. That's important. Where it doesn't all have to be a burning bush. If there's anything burning, you might want to run, by the way. It doesn't have to be a burning bush or a mighty voice. or a, An encounter, though, with God, no matter how small. Because it needs to be cultivated. And the quicker you start, the more you'll learn to hear his voice and say, that's the Lord. Because you know this, when you're seeking him, he's also seeking you. So the job is frankly half done because he's coming towards you. Number three is identity, where you're in a devotion, you're wanting to passionately pursue the fact that you are a grateful son of God. One of the biggest things I think a leader can, can, can learn and have, I'm a son because if you let the job define you, if you let the stuff of church life define you, or just the stuff of life define you, at some point that thing hits a rock. But if you let God define you, then you're a son, you're a daughter, you're a child of God. And to have that branded on the inside and regularly brought forth. Number four, vibrancy. Enjoying his presence. Where your quiet time sometimes is not so quiet, because actually, you learn to sing before the Lord. If you're anything like me, you even dance before the Lord. And if you can't dance by yourself before the Lord, you're probably never going to do it in church anyway. Do it to dance before him and, and watch how a fresh outpouring of his Holy Spirit comes upon you with no, nobody even laying hands. Number five, Honesty. To learn to practice solitude and confession and repentance without it degenerating into I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm no good. It's a whole bunch of people that like to do it that way. You're a son. He saved you by grace. But when things go wrong, you put it right with you. Number six, dependency. Where you're calling out to him for your needs. Because he does want you. Ask me. Ask. And finally, sufficiency where you have the word of God and you know that whatever it is I need, it's in here and it's sufficient for me. God is sufficient for me. That when we look at the contours of our call, you have the natural and you're leaving it beside and saying there is a supernatural dimension to my life and my call. And therefore, because it comes from God, I stay close and I abide under his source and let his source reign over me regularly. And then the third thing I'm going to say to you, talk to you, the final thing, is executing the call. You're going to have to do something because you have the call. You don't just have the call to have it. You now lead out of the call. You lead out of it. That there are things at a practical, functional dimension that he wants you to do. And I'll tell you this, very, it's going to involve speaking for very many of us. It's going to involve speaking, words. When God called Moses, he called him actually to speak. When God called Moses, give me my wonderful staff. A friend of mine loaned me this actually yesterday. It's a hiking stick. 
in those days, you know, <laughs> you would, um, you would be Moses, you know, you had one of these staff. You just did. There were shepherds, you're a shepherd, you have a staff. And in having a staff, you took it every, it became a part of you. A crucial part of you. Because you used it for your job in telling those sheep where to go and where not to go. It was just a part. Moses, when God begins to talk to him and he calls him and he gives him the job description, Moses is like, I, I can't, I think you've got the wrong guy. You should know. I mean, you're God. You should know this. You should know. I'm like, really, you should know. I'm the guy. I'm, 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 I'm not the, how would I explain again? And God's, I'm calling you, and he says this to him. I have come down that you may go and call these people out and bring them up. That's actually the job description. All of this is there in the book of Exodus. I've come down that you may bring them out and bring them up. For me as a shepherd, I understand that's my job. We're about taking people out and bringing them up to God. And he says, I can't do it. And God says, what is that in your hand? I'm sorry? What, what is that in your hand? There's nothing. It's just, what, what the staff? See, you wouldn't even consider this as anything. The staff says, yes. And God says to him, throw it down. And he throws it down, and that thing becomes a snake. At which point he's like, I'm not, a, no part of this. That's, what I, that's exactly what I would have done. Because when I was real young, my mom took us to the zoo and thought it was a good idea. They took us to the reptile, you know, and it, this, 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 this scarred me for life. I want nothing to do with snakes. I couldn't go to the toilet for ages because I didn't know what was going to come out of the loop. <laughs> scarred me for ages. God says, put it down, and he throws it down. From now on, Moses, no, no more of your own props to do life. Put it down. The thing becomes living. It becomes a snake. And then God says, come back, pick it up. By the tail. It's like, how do I know this is God? <laughs> That's what I would have said. Pick it up by the tail. So he picks it. How do you think he picked it up, by the way? Very scared. He, fight, he picks up the thing, and it becomes a staff again. You know, I, every time I think of this, I think, you know, how do you think he took that staff home that day? <laughs> isn't, that, is it, isn't that a good question? How, do you think he took the staff home like, la, 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 Moses, Moses. You think he did that? Mo, mo. I don't think he did that. If he used to do that, he didn't do that that day. Because <laughs> from that moment, he's looking at this staff thinking, I don't trust you. <laughs> I think he went home like this. You keep that thing away from me. Okay, when he got home, imagine his wife is there, zipper, and she's like, he's, he's quiet now. I mean, it takes him like five minutes just to find his own keys to open the door because he's just scared of this and she said, Moses, what are you doing now? He's like, I, I, I don't, I don't want to discuss it. What, what's, what's, what's happened now? Because you're always coming home with something. You know? What's happened now? He's like, you, you won't believe me if I tell you. She's like, try me. No, you won't believe. Try me. You see that stuff? She says, yes. He's like, it's not really a staff. <laughs> she says, what is it, Moses? She's like, it's a snake. <laughs> She's like, Moses, this is going to have to stop. Okay? Because you came home the other day, the bush is burning, something about a voice stole your sandals. This is going to have to stop. And I'm not letting you near the kids anymore. <laughs> From that day, he looked at that staff very differently. Very differently. 
Because this is no longer just something natural. Others may look at it and think it's ordinary, but he knows this thing is a supernatural thing. It's the word of God. That when you, when you, this book, when the spirit of God breathes on this book, it's living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And when you find the way of reading it, the spirit breathes on it, these words come alive and he speaks to you through his word. And you no longer, you, you have a different view of it. That it's not academic anymore. It's not just a bunch of stories anymore. You read it no more for stories, but for discoveries. There are treasures written in here for you to build. His God spoke to me through the word. And that one word is sufficient to carry you for forever. Like a wise man, like a man who walks, he finds treasure in the field. By mistake, he just finds treasure in the field. He goes, he sells everything, and he buys the field. Where you give up everything to say, show me your word. Show me the wonders in your word. Psalm 119 says that. Teach me your way. Show me your wonders in your word. Moses, from that moment, he has something supernatural that he's carrying with him. And God blesses it. Exodus chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says to him, Moses Take that staff with which you shall do signs. That staff became the thing that he used to do miracles, to deliver the Israelites from the Egyptians. So much so in the end, it was no longer called the rod of Moses. It was called the rod of God. And I'm saying this because I think sometimes these days there is a not so much love for the word or a confidence in the word that is kind of gone. But the power is still there if you will let the spirit breathe on it. And it will propel you to do the things that he's called you to do to do your calling right. Draw to a conclusion. When God called Moses, he called him. And he called his name twice. He didn't call him once. He called him twice. Moses. Moses. And it wasn't just for emphasis. I am sure of it. It wasn't just emphasis. He was drilling down on the inside and blowing away any residue of doubt that remains. He knows me. He knows my name. And he is so calling me to himself Moses, Moses. And his answer is the answer that we all should give. Here I am. When he called Abraham about to kill the son, he called him twice. Abraham, Abraham. He says, here I am. When he calls Saul in Acts chapter 9, light he sees. He hears a voice. And he calls him. Saul, Saul. Here I am, Moses says. I'm leaving and abandoning anything that is holding me back to serve you the best way I know how. And whenever we do that or say that, he comes in and he really uses you for his glory. Because who would have thought of it but this man, Moses, God really does use him to deliver the people. Miracles, the Red Sea. Everything. God really does use him. Unbelievable. What makes me so happy, those 40 years that he was there, Mount Horeb, walking around. When they come out, guess who knows the desert more than everybody else? Moses. It turns out nothing is wasted in the economy of God. Nothing. Nothing is wasted. And you may be in a church right now that is just, this is hard. It's not going at the pace we thought. I'm not sure. Am I called? Maybe like Moses, you just need to hear that second call for you to then respond saying, here I am once again. Pour out my heart because I know that you hear 
every cry, I know you're listening. You're faithful to answer. Let us pray. Why don't you stand up? I'd love to pray with you before I go. Why don't you just lift your hands to the Lord as I pray over you? If the musicians want to come back, that would be great. Father, there is a call on everyone's life. And wherever that call has become dry or tired or lost, wherever the vision for it has become blurred, cloudy, so would you come again in the name of Jesus in these moments, Father, and reignite it. Bring life where there is dormancy and death even. Bring life again, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Say, Father, wherever that call seems to have been lost, either through recklessness or carelessness, it's still there. Would you remind right now, I pray, Father, remind every single person here the purpose for which you call them, your heart for them, in the name of Jesus. Call it back open. 